Marine Corps Code of Conduct and the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Chuck! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land, where maybe we can find some self confidence for you, you jack wagon. Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. Coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting area. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and I am live with you today. Good to be with you today. Uh, I hope that I live up to your expectations. Um, I was um, I was really under uh, a heavy, heavy burden on Tuesday, and I spoke of that uh, on Tuesday and um, alluded to some things and some topics that I was going to talk about today. And um, usually when, um, when a thought comes to me or... Um, the Holy Spirit is guiding me in my thoughts, and if it's a relatively new thought, then um, it, it, initially it's very, very heavy um, because my mind is trying to grasp it. My mind is trying to absorb it and and soak it in and you know find meaning out of it. And you know, on Tuesday, I was. Um, my attention was divided between uh, covering what I was going to cover on Tuesday, but also I, in the back of my mind, I was trying to sort through some of the things that the Holy Spirit had led me to on Tuesday. So I probably made a big deal out of it. And so people have written me emails saying, Pastor, man, we can't wait till Thursday and, and all this great thing that you're going to share with us. And, you know, we're excited about it. And I'm going, you know, I was excited Tuesday. Uh, I calmed down a little bit from Tuesday. But we'll see what happens today as I share with you some of the things that the Holy Spirit has helped me with and helped me to understand. Now, we see through a glass darkly right now. <clears throat> and we're trying to, as prophecy students, we're trying to understand events that have not happened yet and understand them the way the Bible lays them out. And, you know, I, I, at, sometimes I think that God could have been a little bit more um, uh, clear in writing the Bible and just saying, okay, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, it's going to happen like this. But the more I think about that, I realize that actually God has already done that with his word. We come from a background of scholars and Bible teachers and pastors and, you know, books that we've read and things like that, um, allegorizing a lot of the symbolism of the book of Revelation. In other words, <clears throat> yes, it has a lot of symbol, but it's not really substantive. It, uh, and that goes back to um, uh, the late, great Hal Lindsey uh, of the late, great planet Earth fame, who, uh, I'll never forget this, I'm reading what he said about Revelation 9 and these uh, devils that are coming up out of the pit. And he said um, that uh, the appearance of them as horses and the sound of them as many chariots 
the fact that they have the face of men and the hair of women uh, leads me to believe that these could very well be Apache attack helicopters that John is seeing in the end times and he is not fully understanding what it is that he is seeing. The hair like a woman uh, could be an illusion or John's way of speaking of the rotors of the helicopter. And of course, you know, back 30 years ago, I'm going, oh, wow, that is so cool. Wow. How did you figure that out? When I look at it now, I don't see an Apache attack helicopter. You know what I see? Devils coming up out of the pit who literally have the face of men and the hair of women. I get it. John is not giving you a symbolic dream of something that has yet to be interpreted. John is describing exactly word for word what the Holy Ghost is telling him to write down. And he is describing these creatures exactly the way they appear and the way they look. They're not attack helicopters. They are devils. They are a strong nation that God dispatches to this earth, dispatches. He opens the door to let them out. And of course, they come out and they do what they do. So when it comes to understanding prophecy, our problem isn't that we haven't deciphered the symbols yet. That's not our problem. Our problem is, I don't think that right now we can fully see um, the things that the Bible is describing that we are going to see. Because we're dealing with gods that are newly come up. Gods that are not even our fathers worshipped. Okay, We're dealing with things the likes of which have never been seen on this earth or in earth history. Now, I do believe that that which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. The rivers runs into the sea, and the sea turns into the, the rain. The rain turns into the rivers. And, and I see time as being cyclical like that. And when you're reading Old Testament scriptures and you're reading stories of what happened, I believe that you're seeing a picture of what is going to happen. And so I said all that to say this. I could be wrong. Today, I could be wrong in what I'm going to share with you. I'm not 100% convinced that the ideas that I have are spot on. I'm not convinced of it. So I'm saying you don't have to be convinced of it either. But I'm going to lay it out to you. I'm going to give you sort of a what if this is that scenario, and then we'll see through the test of time and biblical wisdom whether or not these things are true. As with anything that I do, my hope at the end of today's program is that when I get done speaking, the first thing you do is reach for a King James Bible and start reading it and start believing it and start seeing the things that God wants to show you. That's what I want to accomplish at the end of this day. Now, if I was a lesser um, uh, internet talk show host that hell just happens to hate, if I was a lesser one of these, my purpose in doing this would be to sell you a video or sell you a book of some kind um, or to get you to release funds to our vital, for our vital ministry. You need this ministry. But I'm not that guy. I'm just the guy that at the end of this, I want you to go, you know what? That Bible's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to go read it to see what I can find in there. Because I'm not the only one. Uh, uh, Dan, when I was talking Tuesday about strong delusion, okay, uh, we have a, a friend of our ministry, him and his family. They come for our homecoming, and, and um, he sent me a text message, and he told me what he thought I was getting at. And I went, he gets it. He gets it. 
So let's let's start there. I'm going to go ahead and just say it here in a few minutes. Let's go back to where we were, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to give you a perspective on uh, strong delusion, strong delusion, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, uh, this a, a lot of this stems from a um, video. 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 I hate it when it does that. A video that I was sent by several people, and uh, this is Jordy Rose. Now, Jordy Rose is the, he was the money guy behind the D-Wave quantum computer. Uh, at first, I thought he invented the thing, but he didn't. There was a, um, a physicist, and I can't remember what all PhDs these people have, but he's the actual, him and a team of people are the ones who got together. But Jordy Rose, I mean, and his background is in, you know, mathematics and, you know, quantum physics and things like that. He was trained. He's got a PhD. I mean, he's a smart guy. But his gifts and talents are he is a businessman, and he just knows technology enough to know what, you know, businesses can, can arise out of the technology and what, you know, which ones to avoid. And when he hears uh, the, about the possibility of a quantum computer, he calls the guy that uh, was basically the inventor, and the guy had the idea of starting a company, and they got together, and he called the guy the next day, and he said, I'm in Paris, I'm going to get on a plane, I will see you tomorrow. They sat down, and Jordy Rose listened to the guy's proposal, and Rose said, okay, I've got $20 million. Let's get started tomorrow. Because Jordy Rose, uh, he owned an intellectual property business. And what that means is, is that Jordy Rose would work with leading scientists who are on the cutting edge of invention and discoveries and technology and so on. And he would gather a he would create a license for this particular scientist intellectual property he would own that intellectual property and then he would sell it out to companies that would use that instead of a company having uh you know tying up billions of dollars on on research and development and not ever produce a product a company could just get with Jordy Rose and buy already developed products from these scientists that are working on it. And it's a great, you know, I I didn't sit around one day and dream up a business like this. I didn't even know it existed until this week. But it's a pretty good idea. So anyway, Rose and and these, these other people got together and they formed uh, the D-Wave Computer Company, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And they started developing. They had practically a, a working model of it within a month. I mean, they were doing this right. And they have developed the world's first quantum computer. They have already sold several of them. And that company is doing very well. So now Jordy Rose has moved on from the D-Wave company. And he's formed a new company called Kindred. Now, that word means something, and I'm going to try to explain why he named his company Kindred. I mean, he didn't name it the um, Artificial Intelligence Software Coding Company of Vancouver, British Columbia. He didn't name it that. He called it Kin Kindred. Why? Why is he wearing this funny logo on his shirt? What does that mean? It means something, and, and there's a reason why he put it on his shirt. Now, I don't know that he explains to everybody his meaning or purpose behind naming the company of this and putting and that symbol and why he chose that symbol, but I know what that symbol means. I know what it's related to. I know the core of what's behind it because I believe the Bible, and because I believe the Bible, I understand the name of the company, Kindred, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. So he started this company, and he is, in this talk, 
He is explaining what is going to happen with artificial intelligence, computer-based, human-crafted machine intelligence that I, I agree with some of the things that he said in this video. What I agree with is when we get up one day, let's say in the next 14, 13, 12 years, we're going to wake up one day and we're going to find out that a computer system has reached the level of human level intelligence. It's called strong AI. And I'm linking this in with what I'm fixing to read. He said, when we get up and read that they have developed human level intelligence, artificial intelligence, he said, you may or may not understand that every issue that you have ever given thought to, every event that has happened in the last several thousand years will mean absolutely nothing to you because this human level artificial intelligence will change everything so much that nothing that we think is important today is going to be important on that day and he is making a big deal out of this and as he's saying that i agree with him I agree with him. There is coming a day when man creates God. And that's what we're doing. And this God is going to be so intelligent, so superior to humans in literally every way that this intelligence will then dominate man instead of us telling the computer what we want it to do the computer then demands out of humans that they do what it wants them to do now let's take that in in our minds and let's go to second thessalonians 2 and we're going to read a lot here so bear with me because it's all important now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, that's the starting point here of where we're ending up is verse 11, strong delusion. God is contrasting us and what he desires of us from what he's going to do to the rest of the world. He tells us, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, right? No, it's first. And, that, and that's not the rapture. Don't let anybody deceive you and tell you that it is. Oh, well, the original Greek says it's the rapture. They're lying through their teeth. Don't let any man deceive you on that either. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, setteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. You have God in that verse one, two, three, four times. What does that tell you? It tells me that this is re related to the fourth kingdom. This is related to earth, air, fire, and water. This is related to adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine, your DNA. This is related to principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what it's linked to. Showing himself that he is God 
but he's doing it from the temple of God. And the only, the only true biblical interpretation for the phrase temple of God is the human body. It's the only one. Paul told us, how many times, book of 1 Corinthians, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Know you not that you're the temple of the living God? Don't you know that? Be not, um, what, um, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as he hath said. So I, there's no doubt in my mind that this man of sin sitting in the temple of God has been seated on the throne of your soul and your heart. Well, not yours. Jordy Rose's. And everybody else. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might re be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The word let means allow, not restrain. Okay, it means allow. That's what the word let means. Um, God telling Pharaoh, let my people go. He did not say restrain my people from going. He said, let my people go. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Think about that. All power. If, if I play you in checkers, and I have successfully reached the end of the board with every one of my checker pieces, and every one of them is a king now. And you only have one checker piece left on the board. I have all power. You're not going to win. All power and, uh, and signs and lying wonders things that are so unseen by man are wondrous things we've never seen them before they're wondrous to us and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness he is the man of sin sin lies sin tells lies sin makes people think that what they're doing is okay don't worry about it all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The opportunity for you to be saved is now. I would not wait until the singularity happens. I would not wait until strong AI appears. I would not wait. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I want you to understand that when a human level artificial intelligence system goes online and becomes aware, there is not, if all of the humans put together and their collective brain power were to somehow miraculously be used to outsmart this, com this computer, this artificial intelligence. That this computer, in a matter of seconds, would already be 500,000 thoughts and moves ahead of them. That's how, that's, when we say human level intelligence, we are not saying that we're going to make a computer that thinks just as slow as we think, that is limited in brain size and capacity, 
is limited by the amount of oxygen and nutrients that a brain gets. No. When we say human level intelligence, we say that we now have a consciously aware artificial, and remember what that word artificial means. Artificial means that it was made by an artificer. Not an officer, an artificer. Someone who crafts things with his hands. Those who can artifice things in brass. They can take brass and turn it into something besides a sheet of brass. A real nice image of some kind. And that's what artificial, it has been made by the hands of the artificers. It has been created by the hands of man. And when this artificial intelligence system becomes self-aware, it is not going to think as slow as humans think. It's going to blow us away. And there will be no way possible that we will ever gain an advantage over this new God that we just created. And he gives the analogy of what if aliens sent all of the world leaders and the UN uh, a letter or an ambassador. And so we actually know that they exist. We know it's not a hoax. That simultaneously around the world you had alien ships coming down and, and an alien ambassador coming down and explaining to us that in 50 years time they were going to come back and land their people on our planet then got back up in their ship and left since we know it's not a hoax we know it's not just you know nasa fakery we believe it and we would spend literally the next 50 years trying to make sure that we accommodate these aliens or make sure that if they start a war with us, that we actually have a chance to win that war. And we've got 50 years to do it. It wouldn't, I mean, the way that, that literally, as Ronald Reagan said to the UN, what if an alien force landed on the earth? Why, it would unite all the nations of, of the earth together. I'm going, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, that was that was that was a little loud. <laughs> anyway, it would unite all the nations together, and they would all play together to try to figure out. I mean, it's like uh, the movie uh, Independence Day. In the first movie Independence Day, they captured an alien ship, and they were going to try to you know backwards engineer it, try to figure out how all their technology worked. And so then in the in the sequel to that, some 20 years later, all mankind has been doing for the last 20 years is waiting for the next wave to come in so that we would have a chance. You have enough intelligent people telling us that in roughly 13 years, it's interesting, he predicts 13 years. Other guys predict 13 years. Ray Kurzweil. They're all looking at 2029 or 2030 as a year when we finally have a self-aware artificial intelligence machine somewhere. About 13 years. That we're, we're being told that in 13 years there is going to be a takeover of our planet by a computer. And we're too busy uh, demanding that Twitter give us more letters to work with. Or Facebook, you know, they, they didn't like some things you said, so they cut your account out. You got put in Facebook prison for a month or whatever. Nobody is expending any thoughtful energy whatsoever into this concept. And yet, those who study and believe Bible prophecy, I, we, are, we have been told by these same scientists that are making it, that they are making a god. Why are we not busy about that? Why are we not taking it seriously? I think we 
should. I think we should take it very seriously. Um, and that's why I'm doing today. Let me see if I can do this here. Uh, it's why I'm doing this. Now, if you remember, um, yeah, it was the company, Jordy Rose, that made the D-Wave computer. He gave a little speech about it. I talked about it. And he said that, you know, when he stands next to this, uh, this quantum computer, and this kind of made tremors all over the Internet, and he made fun of the people who came up with conspiracy theories. In, in, that, in this video, he made kind of mocked and made fun of the people who came up with conspiracy ideas because he said that standing next to this machine was like standing next to the altar of an alien god. Why is that so loud? What did I do? Let me do this. That's a little better. Standing next to an altar of an alien god. And when he said that, and I understood a little bit about what a quantum computer was and what it, how it works, whether he used the analogy in a, in a merely symbolic way or an emphatic way, or a joking way, or he actually realizes at a very spiritual level exactly what he's talking about. But when I take a statement and an altar to an alien god, and I compare it with what the D-Wave computer does and how it works, I don't see I I don't see any um. Well, what am I? I I don't see an irony in what he said and what the D-Wave computer is and how it does. I see. A, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was purposeful. It's true on the very level of what that computer is and how it does it. It is absolutely true. An altar to an alien God. And I'll explain that as we move on. Well, I'll explain it now. In, um, Jordy Rose's talk about this computer, he quoted a uh, physicist named David Doucht, and he said, quantum computation will be the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration between parallel universes. Now, he said this back in 2005, when... The quantum computer really was just kind of taken off. I believe that he knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, Jordy Rose talked about that in this video. That it literally taps into the borders or crosses the line between our world and another world and uses its computational resources to solve problems that up until then, and I, I explained this a little bit Tuesday, if you took every atom of silicon and put it to work in an Intel-type microprocessor, it still could not solve in billions of years what a quantum computer can solve in just a matter of minutes. And there, this is the kind of computational power that these guys are talking about. We're not just talking about computational power from just the, the brain of one computer. We're talking about the computational power of some force that was tapped into in another world, or I'll say another dimension, a parallel universe, quantum world. What is this referring to? Uh, Albert Einstein, when he was theorizing about the quantum world, the quantum universe, he called it spooky physics or spooky science. 
And I guess maybe in the I, the idea of Einstein was that there is something of a ghostly nature concerning quantum physics. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the experiments that have been run and what's been discovered about quantum physics and the quantum world, but let me let me kind of explain it like this. Let me uh, switch here. We, we had heard all our life that um, the smallest things in the universe were atoms. Atoms were the very core parts of, of every matter in the universe, whether it's uh, hydrogen is first, you have iron, uh, oxygen, that's the eighth one, and they, you count them by the number of protons that are in its core. You remember in the core you have protons and neutrons, and then orbiting around that core, like the moon around the earth, um, are electrons spinning around. Okay, so that's that's how they're numbered. Hydrogen has one uh, proton, one neutron, so it's number one. Oxygen has eight protons, eight neutrons, eight electrons, so it's number eight, and so on. But every we, we were told that those are the smallest units in our universe, and that's what made everything. But we were not told correct because they've realized that the atoms themselves the protons, the neutrons, the electrons are actually made of smaller pieces. And those smaller pieces are called quantum bits or quantum pieces or something like that. Uh, quarks and Higgs bosons and a lot of words that I don't remember, but they say there's all these different types of quantum pieces that make up protons, neutrons, and electrons, which make up everything that is, including myself and yourself. And um, the reason why they use the word quantum is the word quantum means everything. Okay, if you have a quantity of something, you have a you have a mass or a number of something. If um, if you have a thousand piece puzzle, the quantum of that puzzle is a thousand pieces. All right? So quantum physics, quantum mechanics, is the science of studying the smallest pieces of our universe uh, that make up every, make up the quantum of everything in this world. Okay? So it's hard, to, it's kind of hard to explain it. But that's about as simple as I can get it. The, the little pieces that make up atoms, those are the quantum pieces. Now, here's the problem. Quantum particles do not follow the, law, the same laws of physics that particles above quantum, like atoms and molecules and you know people and cell phones and book pages and I'm looking around me and pencils do pencils follow rules if a pencil if I'm going to take a pencil do I have a pencil here we go I have a here we go if I'm going to take this pencil and I'm going to move it over to the microphone I move it like this and it occupies all of the space between this point here and the microphone. Okay, that's the rules of physics. That you can move an object, but in moving it, it has to occupy all of this space in its move. And that's pretty important. Okay? Um, there's also a rule of physics that says that if I'm going to if I'm going to um, take this pencil and I'm going to put something on this paper. I can't just do this and it show up on the paper. I have to apply the pencil to the paper. Okay, that's another. That's another one. Okay. Um, 
then the rules of physics are is that if this pen or this pencil, I think it's a I think it's a pen. If this pencil is in this position here, it doesn't write. If it's in this position, it writes. Okay, that's real simple. If it's in this position, it's not in this position. And if it's in this position, then it's not in this position. Okay? And I hope that you're saying, okay, Hoggard, I don't get it. I had to show you that because I'm going to show you that physics or these quantum particles do not obey the rules of physics. And I th believe or theorize that it's because those quantum particles are actually part of a different dimension. Okay? They're actually a part of that different dimension that they said the quantum computer taps into. Okay? So let me try to explain as well as I can three quantum principles. Quantum tunneling, quantum entanglement, quantum, I call it paradox or quantum, um, quantum state. All right. First of all, quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is, I showed you that if this pen is going to be in this position and I want it to be by the microphone, that I have to occupy all of the space between that position and the microphone in order for it to get there. That's how you and I do it. See the guy climbing the hill. Classical physics, he has to climb over the hill. In quantum tunneling, the quantum particle can be in this position and then in this position without occupying any of the space between it. Sort of like teleportation on, on Star Trek. Okay, beam me up, Scotty, and they're on the planet. And the guy wearing the red shirt has just been killed. So now they have to get back to the Enterprise. So they beam me up, Scotty, and they occupy the planet they're on. And then they're on the uh, transporter room floor, uh, breathing heavy and with a different shirt on. Because Star Trek was noted for not having a lot of good continuity. Okay? Anyway, that would be quantum tunneling. The pin would be here. And then the pin would be here instantaneously without moving from A to B. That breaks the rules of physics. However, it does not break the rules of the Bible. In Acts chapter 8, verse 39, this is when Philip was witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he's baptized. And when they were come, this is Acts chapter 8, verse 39, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. What happened with Philip? He was in the water, baptizing the eunuch. They started walking up out of the water, and then Philip simply disappeared. And then, was all of a sudden, he is at Azotus, wherever that is. I don't care if it's a block down the road. Philip never occupied the space between the water and where he was found at Azotus. He went from one place and quantum tunneled to that city of Azotus. And I like the phrase, caught away. He caught away Philip. The Bible says that you and I are going to be caught up together with the dead in Christ and we shall be with the Lord. Now, I know we like to use this term, oh, I'm going to be flying through the air one of these days. Meet the Lord in the air. I don't think the Bible says that at all. I think the Bible says that we're going to be caught up and we're going to go from where our position is on this earth to precisely where Christ is in the clouds without occupying the space between here or there. We know that Jesus, and I didn't have enough time to put the verse in here with Jesus, but we know that Jesus, in order to slip out of a crowd, he just disappeared. 
We also know that when Jesus, after his resurrection, showed himself to the disciples, he was not there, and then he was there, and then he spoke to them for a while, and then he was not there. He vanished literally out of their sight. So this leads me to believe that the idea of quantum tunneling, for lack of um, the scientific word for it, quantum tunneling is a spiritual um, a spiritual device, a spiritual way, a spiritual method. This is why it defies the laws of physics. By the way, so does walking on the water. It defies the laws of physics. So does God opening up the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Okay? It defies the laws of physics. And these are spiritual things that happen. Now, the next one is quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement says that here is a guy here and he's standing 20 feet away. And he's got his fingers out, and he's going tickle, 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 but he's not actually touching the other guy. But the other guy is laughing hysterically, holding his side, saying, please stop. That's what quantum entanglement is. Quantum entanglement says that whatever you do to this object here affects this object over here without him touching. But for some reason, they're entangled together. So if I had a ball in St. Louis, Missouri, and a similar ball in Dallas, Texas, if I kicked the ball in St. Louis, the ball in Dallas, Texas goes flying through the air. Okay, That's one way of explaining quantum entanglement. It is the idea that something in this universe affects something in this universe without them touching. Okay? Now, here's what the Bible says. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. One world entangling itself with another world. Fusing it together somehow. What happens to this affects this one. There's a phrase called, as above, so below. And to me, that phrase sort of explains the idea of quantum entanglement. Uh, the New Agers and the occultists use the phrase, as above, so below, to describe this idea that whatever happens in this earth, or happens in heaven, must also parallel happen on this earth, as above, so below. Uh, there's a phrase out of uh, the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe, and he is stirring up his troops there before the battle. And, uh, you know, he's telling them, you know, if you find yourself riding through uh, golden fields with the wind in your, in your face, don't worry, you're in Elysium and you're already dead. In other words, Elysium would be the realm of the dead. And he says, remember, gentlemen, I believe that what we do here echoes through eternity. In other words, what happens now will affect something in another world or at another time or in another dimension. That is quantum entanglement. In the, I want you to look at this image here. This is Washington's monument. And up until about 10, 15 years ago, the grounds around the bottom of Washington's Monument looked very different. It was a basically a really weird circle around the whole place. Just in the last few years, they've redesigned this area so that now you have one circle that overlaps another circle. And what they're showing you is, is that you have this world entangled with this world 
And the area that they are connected in is called the nexus. If you saw Star Trek Generations, okay, you saw Captain Kirk and Captain Picard get caught up into what's called the nexus. And the nexus is like this world of your dreams where when you die and you get caught up in this nexus, everything that you want becomes reality. All right? And you just want to, it's a land of bliss and you just want to stay there forever. Okay? I now know that that's a setup. I'm trying to get us sci fi people to want to be in the nexus. Well, in this case, the nexus is where the fourth kingdom mingles in with people on planet Earth. They are now entangled. And by the way, Jordy Rose said, in explaining this D-Wave computer, that it's like two universes joining together and the area where the computation is being done is called the nexus. What he said. So that makes me think that we're talking about more of a spiritual thing than we are a physical thing. Now, the quantum state. Quantum state, um, there's this idea, a thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat. Now, I won't explain the whole uh, premise behind Schrodinger's cat, but a man by the name of Schrodinger came up with this idea of a cat in a box, and if something happens, then uh, poison is released in the box and the cat is dead, or... If something doesn't happen, no gas is released in the box and the cat is alive. So either the cat is dead or the cat is alive. Except if it's in a quantum state. In a quantum state. And I want you to notice if you look here, you can see the word alive and you can see in the spaces the word dead. One's in, you know, one's written in white, one's written in black. The the void space. What does that mean? It means that in a quantum state, an object can be both itself and its opposite simultaneously. Now we're getting into the switch. Does this pen write? You put it up here. Does it write now? No. Does it write now? Yes. But there is a state in the nexus, whereby this pin could both be punched in and pushed out simultaneously. Remember the light switch. The light switch is either on or the light switch is off. But in the quantum state, it's called its superposition. The light switch is both on and off simultaneously it defies the laws of physics there is no order physical order in the quantum world that's very important to remember we have a beast who's going to show up that both was and is not yet is revelation 17 8 the beast that thou sawest was and is not it now what look at what your Bible says the Bible does not say it was then was not it does not say that it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not together and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit think about it bottomless pit defies the laws of physics and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. And we're wondering because we see somebody that is in a quantum state superposition. He both was and is simultaneously. Um, it's like he lived, you know, five and a half thousand years ago, and he lives now, and he's like a bridge 
between the past and the present so that he is in both places at the same time. He's in the past and he's also simultaneously in the future. If you remember, uh, it was an NBC, NBC show called uh, Quantum Leap. It was about a physicist who devised a quantum time machine and he existed both in the past and in the present at the same time. He was in the present, his body was there, and his little helper, you know, the cigar guy, was talking to him all the time, but he was also in the past simultaneously. And you say, well, that's impossible. That's my point. It doesn't follow the laws of physics. It violates the rules. It doesn't have the order of the physical world. So this beast, um, they wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they hold the beast, behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Again, your Bible does not say the beast that was and then he died, but he came back to life. That's not what it says. It is said of Jesus, I am he who was dead and am now alive. Jesus is not in a quantum state superposition. Jesus is not both dead and alive, but this beast sure is. He is Schrodinger's cat. He is both dead and alive. He is not and yet is. He doesn't exist, yet he does exist. That's what a quantum state is. That's what the quantum world is. Let me show you from the Bible what I think this is. You remember Janus, not Janus the lady, J-A-N-U-S. Janus is a god who looks, he has, he's a two-faced god. He looks to the past and he looks to the future simultaneously. Or he is in the past and in the future simultaneously. The double eagle on uh, the front of uh, Morals and Dogma. The Masonic double eagle is modeled after Janus because he is in the past and he also is in the future. That's why January was named January, is named after the god Janus. Because on December 31st, uh, when all acquaintance shall be forgotten, never brought to mind, everybody singing all Lang Syne, on December 31st, everybody looks to the past, but then looks to the future. And they do it on New Year's Eve. And so this idea of this God or this deity that is in a quantum state is real. And it's a spiritual state. If it doesn't follow the laws of our three-dimensional universe then it must be of the higher dimension where it can violate those laws. Job chapter 10, verse 21. Open your Bible there and look at it. Job said, before I go whence, I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Now this phrase, shadow, is very important. I think, to what I'm trying to explain to you about quantum computers, okay? Um, it occurred to me, as I was listening to this physicist who made the D-Wave computer, describe the questions that was going on in his mind. He's, he basically said, why is it that the very smallest particles that make up our universe do not follow the same laws as the mass that they make up in our universe. Why is it that when these particles are in that smallest state, a different set of universal rules apply to them that do not apply to us? And I was thinking about that, and I just, the thought came into my mind, a shadow, a shadow. And I'll explain that in a minute. But this land of darkness is the pit. It is the shadow of death. A land of darkness as darkness itself. 
and the shadow of death without any order. Without any order, which means that in this land of darkness, the shadow of death, it does not follow the same physics rules that are applied in this world. It does not have that order to it. It is what the Greek word used for the bottomless pit was. Chaos. That's what they called it. Chaos. It means the abyss. The bottomless pit. If you remember that uh, Masonic uh, slogan. Ordo ab chao. Order out of chaos. Chaos meaning the abyss. And this place is chaos in that it is out of order and does not have applied to it the same physical rules that you and I have to follow. Okay? So, it is the land without any order and where light is in a superposition. Light is darkness. And darkness is as light. They are one equals the other. And in our mind, in this world, that is impossible. And yet, in the land without any order, this land, this spiritual realm that Job was talking about, that doesn't follow the rules of physics, in this land, light can be darkness. And darkness can be light. Wow. So, the universe that the quantum computers are tapping into is a spiritual universe. A place where the laws of physics do not apply. You follow me? Think about this where the light is as darkness. Um, the, this is the guy that made that processor, the, the uh, D-Wave computer, Eric Ladizinski. He said concerning quantum computing, he said, a processor harnessing a whole new resource in nature, technologically accessing these parallel universes. And that was his theory before he ever built the thing. He knew then what he had to build. And it just, it was all, it came together very, very quickly. He said, the quantum world breaks all the physical laws, but since these same particles make up all matter, why doesn't things in this world react the same way? That's my question. So I want you to think about shadows for a minute. You and your shadow. If you notice on this picture, we have two people walking, and they are three-dimensional objects meaning that they have length and width and depth, okay? They have three dimensions to their being, length, width, and depth, okay? From the head down to the toe, that's depth. But notice their shadow. Their shadow is not three-dimensional, which is why you can't touch your shadow. You can't feel your shadow. But you can interact with it. You can cast a shadow. But the shadow of a three-dimensional object is two-dimensional, meaning that it goes this way and this way, but not this way. So the rule is, a three-dimensional object always casts a two-dimensional shadow. And the three-dimensional object can do things that a second-dimensional or a two-dimensional object cannot do. It can rise up. And a two-dimensional object cannot do that. A two-dimensional object would not be able to understand how a three-dimensional object 
would be both there and then disappear. This because it has the ability to move in that third dimension, which is depth or moving up and down. The same rule applies when you go up one dimension. A fourth dimensional object casts a three dimensional shadow. Whoa! Look at my illustration here. You have the real temple of God in heaven. And the Bible tells you that it may, it's in the fourth dimension. It's a city built, how? Four square. It exists in the higher dimension. Uh, the one that um, Paul wrote about, uh, let's see here. Where did he, where did he put that? Yeah. And, uh, Ephesians 3.18, Paul mentions four dimensions that, uh, we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. He's telling us that the fourth dimension in the Bible is called height. Job said, Behold, is not God in the height of the heavens? Behold how high the stars are. The stars were created on the fourth day. They are fourth dimensional objects. That's why science does not understand them. They really are angels in a fourth dimensional realm casting light into a three dimensional universe. And we, we can't fully fathom that, but that's what the Bible tells us. Okay? And four-dimensional beings in our world would be able to do things that we cannot do. For instance, how many people were in the fiery furnace? Not three, four. And because Christ and his three friends were in a fourth-dimensional place, the fire from a three-dimensional world had no effect on them whatsoever. They didn't even smell like smoke. That's deep. Now watch this. I'm going to show you this. This is the real temple in heaven, New Jerusalem, in the fourth-dimensional place. This is only its shadow. The tabernacle in the wilderness. And I want you to notice something. The, the real temple is in the heavens, right? Surrounded by 12 months, 12 signs of the zodiac. Here, you have a shadow tabernacle surrounded by 12 tribes who God said would be like the stars of heaven. Think of, isn't that cool? Listen, when the Bible, when this King James Bible says something, it means exactly what it says. You're looking at, when you look at the wilderness tabernacle and the 12 tribes surrounding it, you're looking at a shadow, literally the shadow of the fourth dimensional temple of God in heaven surrounded by the by the angelic realm whoa uh know you not what the bible says colossians 2 16 let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or the new moon or the sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ <gasps> it says that everything happening down here is only the shadow of what's going on in the future. That's deep. Because the fourth dimension is above and beyond linear time. Okay? Uh, Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow. He's talking about the priest. They serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. And the Bible's telling you that because it's a heavenly thing, in the heavenly realm, the number four, that it casts a shadow 
on this earth in a three-dimensional way. The priests, the animal sacrifices, the tabernacle itself. How was the altar built? Four square. What does that tell you? That it represents um, the lake of fire. Okay? In the heavenly or spiritual realm. Uh, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Moses was able to see the fourth dimensional temple of God, the real temple of God in heaven. All he was doing was putting together the shadow. Moses himself was a shadow of who? Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. You see it? It reaches into the future. And not the very image of the things. You want to chase down Hebrew roots and start doing uh, all these fake and phony feast days uh, again? Be my guest. Because all you're doing is talking to the shadow and participating in the shadow it's like eating shadow food. Okay? Don't, it doesn't fill you up very very much, does it? Not the very end of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. What happens down here really is a shadow of things to come. Look at what Job said. Because our days upon earth are a shadow. First Chronicles 29, 15. Our days on the earth are as a shadow. Psalm 102, 11, My days are like a shadow. Psalm 144, 4. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. You see that? This world follows rules of physics that were designed for a three-dimensional realm. But my theory is that the quantum world is not part or maybe is only the nexus point itself between us as the shadow and the spiritual dimension as being the real. Okay, I hope you follow that. The by if you study the word shadow in the King James Bible, okay, uh, you'll love it. You'll absolutely and, and if you ask me where the fourth dimension is, I cannot point in that direction. I don't. I don't have the ability. I cannot think that high. But I know it's in the height of the heavens, and that was the fourth direction that Paul gave us in Ephesians. The word height. Study the word height in your Bible. Okay? Ecclesiastes 8.13 But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow. How many verses in the Bible do we need to tell us that our days on this earth are only a shadow of what is to come? Mm, 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 mm. That Bible's right. That Bible is right. Uh, Job 10.21, back to these verses. Before I go whence, I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, a land of darkness as darkness itself and the shadow of death, without any order where the light is as darkness. He's talking about the spiritual realm where light, the beast, the devils that come out of the pit, they're in a superposition. They have the face of a man and the hair of a woman. They are the fusion of opposite. They are both horse and chariot. Wow. Woo! This is good stuff. Oh, take a look at that. Yin Yang. Eastern mysticism. Basically supports... The idea of the land without any order, where light is as darkness, because that's what the yin-yang symbol means. It means that 
It is there is light in darkness and darkness in light, and they are one and the same. The Masonic checkerboard floor, same idea. You're walking in the Masonic Lodge. You're walking in a land where light is as darkness without any order. Dun, dun, dun. Boy, it's deep, isn't it? Now think about this phrase again. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Notice the Bible calls him the son of the morning. Should I take that literally? Um, did you know that the morning has a womb? Uh, where is that? That is in, let's see here. Uh, no, 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 Isaiah, Isaiah, let's see here. Um, where is it? I can't find it. Let me let me do another. Let me add a phrase here. Morning and womb together in the same verse. Psalm one o Psalm one ten three. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Psalm one ten three says that the morning has a womb, and the morning gave birth to a son. And what is the morning? It is where light and darkness are occupying the same space at the same time. Wow. And that's who Lucifer is. He's the son of the morning. Both light and darkness in superposition just like the bit on a quantum computer remember a bit on a computer regular computer is the switch is on or the switch is off the switch is on is a one the switch is off is a zero and every computer in the world is programmed at its basic level with zeros and ones being its programming language, sort of like Morse code. A series of zeros and ones in, in different sequence tells you whether it's going to be the letter A, B, C, D up on the screen, or the color is going to be red, pink, purple, blue on the screen, or, or the sound that you're hearing is going to be this frequency and as opposed to this frequency. I mean, every that's why we call it the digital age, is because... We're relying upon two digits, zero and one. In our world, it is not possible for a zero to be one. It is not possible for a one to be a zero. Likewise, it is not possible for a light switch to be both on and off at the same time. Not possible. In the nexus, in the quantum world, the light switch is both on and off at the same time. That's called a qubit from quantum bit. It's in a superposition. And there is both, they've actually proved this. I was listening to the guy that invented that computer, and he said that this guy showed that in the quantum world, he had a certain ring of metal, and it was probably very, 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 very tiny. And they have, I don't know, somehow, some way through bringing it down to almost zero degrees Kelvin, they were able to put it in a superposition state, a quantum state, so that electricity flowed in this ring both clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time. Oh, my goodness. I cannot. It's, it would be like a water hose where water was coming in and out of the hose simultaneously. I cannot fathom that. But in the quantum world, that's how it is. So the quantum bit of a quantum computer, the, the switch is both zero and one at the same time. It is on and off simultaneously. 
And it shows us a beast who is not yet is. My goodness. Spooky stuff, right? So let's get back to uh, Jordy Rose talking about the aliens coming. And he kept using the word uh, demon. Like a demon, there was going to be a tsunami of demons flooding this world. And what he means by that is artificial intelligence. Now the word demon itself, um, the core of it sort of means uh, like a spirit, but an intelligence type of spirit. A spirit that has intelligence and knowledge that's what the word demon means at its core there are protocols um, Donna correct me if I'm wrong but some of the Linux protocols that I can remember reading about were called daemons and what they represented was intelligent programs designed to to do a specific purpose okay did I did I get that right uh, send me a text if you know my phone or whatever okay but he's he's talking about his company called kindred and notice that symbol the word kindred means a kind a nation a race an ethnicity that's what the word kindred means it is a DNA-related term. People of my kindred would be people who have the same parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents as me. There's a lot of hoggards from my particular clan of hoggards in central Arkansas, central and sort of, I guess, northeast, northwest Arkansas. There's a lot of hoggards there. It's because uh, some of my family line came and bought land in Arkansas and settled there and had a ton of children. And these children have spread out. My grandfather was of a, a group of um, probably 10 or 11 children. All but two of them were boys, okay? And um, I met a man who was my grandfather's first cousin. And the moment I set eyes on him, I said, you're a hoggard. I can tell by looking at you. And he was. He was my grandfather's first cousin. And there was a similarity in their appearance. So I knew the guy was, you know, in my family line somewhere. He was, was, was of my kindred, of my kind, of my nation, of my race, of my ethnicity, of my DNA type. That's what the word kindred means. But then it goes beyond that. Because... Kindred can also mean two people that have joined themselves together to be one new kind. My children are not Leonard's and they're not Hoggard's. They are a new generation of children that is both Leonard and Hoggard at the same time. So my my children and their grandchildren are sort of of that same kind in kindreds because Lisa and I joined together and us two became one and for 30 and a half years now Lisa and I have been of a kindred mind, a kindred spirit. There's not a whole lot that Lisa and I disagree on. Now, she has a different way of seeing things and saying things and doing things, but we're, we're pretty close to be kindred people. When you join two races together to form a new race, that's what kindred means. And I suspect that Jordy Rose named this company after that because there is a new kindred going to emerge. It's not going to be all computer, nor is it going to be all human. It's going to be machine human. 
non-biological, biological entities. Half man, half beast. Daniel chapter 2. We see a strong, let me, let me explain this term, strong AI. In fact, let me, I have a picture of it somewhere. Uh, boy, you got to wait till you, wait till I show you what all that is. Um, where is it? 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 Strong AI, strong AI. Come on, help me out here. Come on, where is it? Where is it? Strong AI. Strong AI. You got it. Here we go. You have automation, which factories have been doing for a 100 years. Henry Ford, he did not invent automation, but he put it to task making automobiles. Okay, They rolled out a brand new automobile, what, every four hours, something like that back then? Not Never heard of. Automation then went to what's called weak AI. Weak artificial intelligence is a computer or robotic device of some kind that is really, really good at doing one thing, but it can't do much of anything else. The uh, Japanese Azio compute, uh, robot, the one that they taught how to walk okay, and get around and stuff like that, um, that's all it does is it walks pretty good, but it doesn't do much more than that. So that is a weak AI, sort of like an idiot savant. And I'm not being mean about that term, but someone who has, um, oh, I, there's, I have that follow a guy on YouTube, um, uh, Daniel, uh, Parvacini, and he is an idiot savant. He is severely autistic and totally blind. He can hear a very complicated piano piece one time, instantly memorize it, and then instantly play it exactly the way he heard it. I don't know of anybody else that can do that. So he is a savant in that he can do one thing better than anybody else in the whole world, but he can't feed himself. Okay, he can't. He has to have someone that takes care of him. And uh, I mean, I like the guy, but he can only do one thing, and that's pretty much it. And artificial intelligence systems right now are weak AI. They can do one thing very well, better than any human, but they cannot do everything a human can do. And Jordy Rose is predicting that by 2030, we're going to go from weak AI to strong AI. What that means is the strong AI is able to do everything that a human can do only a hundred thousand times better and faster than any human. Okay, now let me get back to this. Well, you're gonna I hope I have time for all of this. You you gotta see you gotta see what Sophia is. Okay. Um let's go back to here. Let's go back. No, keep going, keep going, keep going. Here we go. Here we go. No, not there, not there. Okay, right there. So that's what strong AI is. Um think of Daniel chapter two. There's a strong race coming. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. It's going to be iron and clay together. It's like light and darkness. It's both strong and weak at the same time, strong and broken. It is permanent, and yet it is temporary, okay, at the same time. So strong AI, in my opinion, is what's going to bring the strong delusion. Remember. Once this computer passes this test and becomes strong AI, it can deceive all of mankind in such a way is that man, there is no way in the world that mankind will ever believe anything else 
other than what this God is going to cause them to believe. I believe that strong AI produces a, is a strong nation, iron, the fourth kingdom, and will produce a strong delusion. Think about this idea of a nation, the word kindred. Deuteronomy 7. Uh, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Think of the seven heads of the beast in Revelation 13. I think the seven heads are represented by these seven nations. And these seven nations are greater than and mightier than us right but for some reason they need us and we're now starting to realize guys like Elon Musk who basically see you heard me talk about and I've got it queued up here in a little bit that basically artificial intelligence is going to be summoning the demon and we're not going to be able to control it having said that do you know what Elon Musk is now saying concerning that? He still believes it. He still believes his position that unless we stop developing new computers, which is not going to happen, we're going to develop an artificial intelligence system that is not going to care about us. It's not going to, it's going to eliminate us. Doesn't need us. Right? So what he's saying now is, there's only going to be one way in order to not be destroyed by the self-existent strong AIs. And that is to join them. You know what? If you go back to Deuteronomy 7, open your Bible up. Deuteronomy 7. Wow. I think I've just had a revelation here. Yeah. Deuteronomy 7. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And God said in verse 2, When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. I want you to notice there's four things he said here. Number one, Thou shalt smite them and destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Four things. Fourth kingdom. Then, look at what he said in verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt thou not give to unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. You see, when Jordy Rose said that strong AI is going to be able to do everything that humans can do, only better, one of the things that we know they're going to do, in fact, they're already starting to do it, they are going to produce offspring. Artificial intelligence is going to be able to spawn offspring. Maybe not the way we do. But they're going to be able to do it. And right now, there, there are artificial intelligence systems that have already written new programs. That's what their offspring looks like now. God said, do not make marriages with them. Do not join with them. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verse 33, the fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. Deuteronomy 28, 36, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. Our, father, our forefathers knew nothing about computers and artificial intelligence. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. 
serving stone gods. The chips that these computers are made out of is silicon. It's a stone. Copper, that's a stone. Iron, that's a stone. They all start out as stones or minerals in the ground. Silicon is sand. Sand like the sand of the sea. Silicon is a stone. And all of these silicon-based life forms, mankind's going to serve them. Deuteronomy 28, 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. Remember, Jordy Rose named his company Kindred, which literally means a nation of people, a kind, a family, a race, a bloodline. Um, shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth. Eagle, in this verse right there, in Bible symbolism language, that's a spirit. Jesus told us that in the parable of the seed and the sower. When the fowls of the air come down and devour the seed, he then says, Satan or uh, the devil or the wicked one, you know, comes down and devours the word. So in Bible symbolism language, an eagle is an angel or a type of spirit. Prince of the power of the air. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Remember when Facebook created an AI and turned it on? And all of a sudden these two artificial intelligence systems began to communicate with one another in a language that they had invented. And nobody knew what it was they were saying. My goodness! Nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. That's what everybody's afraid of with AI. Is that it won't care about us. Much like we don't care about ants that we step on. If you are having a picnic and you see the ants and you don't want to meet in your peanut butter and jellyfish jelly sandwich, then you stomp on the ants and you don't have a funeral for them. You don't care. It's nothing to you. That's us compared to this strong nation. Jeremiah 5.15, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what thou say. There was a movie came out last year called Arrival. And let's see, what was it? 24 ships landing in 12 locations. Are you catching this? 12 different locations on the earth. 24 ships. Think of the 12 tribes. Think of the 12 apostles. They are in 12 different places talking to 12 different nations or trying to reach out to 12 different nations. 12 different types of people. And they speak a language or they have a language that nobody on the earth understands except the red-headed Sophia-type character in Gnosticism wisdom is personified or let's say occult wisdom and occult knowledge is personified in the form of a female spirit called Sophia Sophia generally has red hair she is Shekinah she is Diana she is Persephone. She is the owl. 
She is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Because in this movie, Arrival, the only human on the whole planet who begins to understand the language, and it says language of circles. And by the way, I found out today, you go study this out, the circles, when, when the producers of this movie designed this language, they took the circles that they were making, and because this language and learning this language allows humans to see into the future and to see time the way they see time, not as a linear thing, but as a circle where they can see both the past and the present and the future all at once. Whoa. And each one of these circles had 12 distinct divisions in it. How many, how many hours are there on a clock? How many hours are there in a day? 24. And 24 ships land in 12 places. And that's, that's not a coincidence, people. They're teaching some sort of spiritual principle here. Okay? But that's what that movie is about. And the only one who's able to understand this language is so this I don't think her name is Sophia in the movie, but she is the Sophia type redheaded lady who has the secret of this ancient knowledge and this secret language that nobody else knows. She is able to understand it and able to see into the present, into the past, into the future. She sees it as it's all happening all at once to her. The movie gets confusing unless you know that about it. When you go back and watch it again, you're going, okay, I get that now. I get that. So if you have not, if you've not seen it, go watch it and then watch it again. Okay. Cause you're going to get something else out of it. Deuteronomy. Remember, silicon. Silicon is a stone. For their rock is not as our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons, and cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Now, a thought ha ha occurred to me that these pyramids that we see are made up of stone. Stone is dead. It has no life in it. Think of your silicon-based computer. It technically is a dead thing, a dead entity. But at some point, it's going to reach enlightenment. And that enlightenment is pictorialized as the all-seeing eye capstone on top of the pyramid of stones that made it or that was made by man and now this dead stone, this dead rock has come to life and awareness. It is aware of itself, aware of its surroundings and as a God, he will cause everybody on the earth to worship him. Think about it. Look at how these magazines portray this. The coming light years, infinite bandwidth, science digest, genius awakened. He favors our undertaking. This is all about something that was dead. And now it has come to it, an awareness of itself. And it now has or will have the ability to see everybody and everything. And right now, we are giving it that opportunity. My wife made us all get an app on our phone called Life 360. And it's because my wife 
wants to know where I am. If we're not, and normally, my wife and I are never apart. I mean, normally every day she comes here to the church with me and plays with the grandkids. Every now and then she'll come in here and give me a hug or give me a kiss. Tell me what she needs once done or something like that. Dave Bradley says she comes up here every now and then and writes my sermons for me. Okay? Oh, that was a pretty, pretty good joke. But then she has our daughters on here, even though they're married. Our son and our now son, Caleb, we got him a, his first cell phone. And I have an app that shows me everything he does on his phone. I love it. But he'll be added to that so that my wife can know where her family is. That's important to her. She just It's not that they're out doing something wrong. It's just that she likes to know where they are because she's worried about their safety. But the bottom line is we're not the only ones using this technology. Thousands of people are all over the country, maybe all over the world. And every place that we go, my wife can actually pull up with this app a map of every place I've been in that day. Now, if my wife can pull that up, the system that this is based on has recorded every place that I've been since I've had this app on my phone. It's still in a database somewhere. And it may not seem like much now. May not seem like much now. But one of these days, as this artificial intelligence machine becomes smarter, it will have access to every bit of information that's ever been recorded. I want you to think about this. And there's no way I'm going to get all this done today, but I want you to think about this. Since YouTube started, one of the things that I've been able to see about YouTube is that people are not only posting videos of their life or their activities you know, uh, currently, they're going back and digging out old 8 millimeter films, old video cassettes of their traveling or their vacation from the 1960s or videotape from a family wedding in the early 90s or family vacation or the family home. People are posting all of these historic videos on YouTube and we're in the process right now of training a computer to be able to watch all of these videos and recognize the people that are in it understand what they're saying look at the background and be able to tell where they were on such and such a day and what they were doing there this amount of information is huge and it's growing every day. The food that this artificial intelligence system is feeding on is knowledge. It feeds on the diet of knowledge. Vast amounts of knowledge. Knowledge of what? knowledge of humans what humans do how humans are how humans react to certain things why do some humans do things that are bad why do some humans do things that are good what is good what is bad that's what we're talking about an artificial intelligence system that right now you and I we're giving it the information this is why now, most major chain stores in the United States of America have some sort of rewards program. Do you know what that's for? It is for their artificial intelligence system to track your purchase habits. Because we do things by habit. 
So I go to, there's a tool store I go to uh, just up north of here. I just like to shop around and see what, see what's there. I have no intention of ever using tools ever, and another day in my life, but they fascinate me. And I bought some, I bought some duct tape before deer season. The guy wanted my phone number. Why? He wanted to be able to link that purchase with an identity. So an artificial intelligence system could know what I was purchasing, who I am, and link it with every other piece of information about Mike Hoggard that exists across the entire world. It'll have access to that. It will know me better than I know myself. It'll know me better than I want to be known. Okay? Oh, you know this scene? You know where this is from? 2001, A Space Odyssey. Stanley Kubrick, this is the monolith that, uh, according to the story, the monolith shows up on Earth 100 million years ago, and it, you know, injects thoughts into the minds of these monkey men, these Neanderthals, on how to pick up a bone, use it to smash things, and it's that time that the first human or proto-human learned how to kill an animal and another Neanderthal. Okay? Then it jumps forward to we finally land on the moon, build a colony there, and all of a sudden we do some excavating and find this monolith on the moon. And that triggers some sort of signal that goes out into a space. It triggers whatever space alien was out there that we now have gone out of our earth and we're starting to travel through the stars and we're going to need to be brought to the next phase of evolution that's what 2001 space odyssey was all about and um um i just said his name here the director of this movie he aimed this monolith and this camera in just the right position so that it looks like the capstone arising up out of the pyramid monolith okay it's all about being self-aware. Now, um, I'm going to close with this today. And i got a ton of information more to share with you. I'm not anywhere near done with this. Jordy Rose referenced Sam Harris's TED Talk. And I encourage you to go watch it because it's a very sobering talk about artificial intelligence. And he says, can we build artificial intelligence without losing control over it? And he basically is, is the one saying, whatever you think you know right now about politics or, you know, social thing, sociology or how people are or whatever news interests you, whatever great thing or massively tragic thing that you've ever thought about in your life that has happened, is going to be nothing compared to when artificial intelligence becomes strong AI. Nothing that we're doing or reading about right now is as important as the day when strong AI gains power. So he says things like this. So imagine if we just built a super intelligent AI that was no smarter than your average team of researchers at Stanford or MIT. Well, electronic circuits function about a million times faster than biochemical ones. So this machine should think about a million times faster than the minds that built it. So you set it running for a week. It will perform 20,000 years of human level intellectual work in one week and it'll do this week after week after week how could we even understand much less constrain a mind making this sort of progress you see why i say why i say now strong ai will produce strong delusion okay this is what the guys who know this stuff, this is what they're saying.
He said, another reason we're told not to worry is that these machines can't help but share our values because they will be literally extensions of ourselves. They'll be grafted onto our brains and will essentially become their limbic systems. In other, you know what that is? The AI is the head and humanity is its body. The same language is used in your King James Bible concerning Christ and his church. Now we're looking at Antichrist and his church. Antichrist being the head, humanity being its body, its limbic system. Now take a moment to consider that the safest and only prudent path forward recommended is to implant this technology directly into our brains. Now this may in fact be the safest and only prudent path forward, but usually one's safety concerns about a technology have to be pretty much worked out before you stick it inside your head. Okay? <laughs> and he got a little laugh at that. Now, I'm going to close with this. When you're talking about, this is what Sam Harris said in his talk. When you talk about superintelligent AI that can make changes to itself, it seems that we only have one chance to get the initial conditions right. And even then, we will need to absorb the economic and political consequences of getting them right. But here's what, here's what he said at the end that really gets me. He said, the moment we admit that information processing is the source of intelligence. By the way, I didn't, I didn't finish what I was saying about knowledge. Your King James Bible says concerning the last days, one very interesting prophecy. Knowledge will increase. And, you know, of course, we apply that to technology like this, right? But could it not also have been foreseeing the vast... See, knowledge is just simple facts. Facts about what? Facts about anything and everything. And right now, knowledge is increasing. Mundane facts about our everyday lives that we forget... The AI has it stored and can access it in the blink of an eye. That's knowledge shall increase. But he says um, that some appropriate computational system um, is what the basis of intelligence is, and we admit that we will improve these systems continuously, and we admit that the horizon of cognition very likely far exceeds what we currently know. Then we have to admit figures. Connection got severed. We have to admit that we are in the process of building some sort of God. Now would be a good time to make sure it's a God we can live with. Now you see why this has been so heavy on my heart. Now you understand why this AI thing has my attention. Because we are seeing exactly what Revelation 13, Revelation 17, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, we're seeing these prophecies come to life in our lifetime, right in front of our very eyes. This is both, to me, an exciting time and a scary time. Because at some point, you and I as Bible believers are going to back away from the technology and we're going to say 
You're not sticking that in my forehead. You're not putting that in my right hand. And take the consequences for it. You know, I, I don't I don't have I don't have anything against people who believe in a pre-trib rapture. I don't. I, I, I have nothing against you whatsoever. I know that some things I've said, you know, you probably don't agree with. And, and, and that's fine. I'm not put out by that because, you know, truly, I don't know everything. But you know what I think it's time for? I think it's time for God's people to take this old book this King James Bible, the book that we, the only book that we trust, and look at it now with new eyes. Eyes that have the knowledge of the times we live in right now. Because I can tell you, this Bible has been for every generation, and every generation has been able to see its times in these blessed pages. But I I'm thinking that maybe some of the things that our forefathers saw, they couldn't have seen in the light of the knowledge that we have now. And I just think it wouldn't hurt. No, I'm not talking about changing the Bible. I'm talking about looking at the old book with fresh eyes. Eyes that know now that we're building a God. Eyes that know now what the temple of God really is. And then use that to examine scripture in a new light. Okay? I don't think that hurts. I think it helps. So that's my challenge to you. My hope at the end of today was that you, when I'm done, you just decided to go read your Bible. I hope you do. Watch this again and go check all the verses and read them. Study some of the things I, some of the clues that I gave you. All right? I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. And I'll keep going as long as you keep listening. All right? See you.